Good afternoon. Welcome to today's TASA webinar, Accident Investigations for Attorneys. During this program, our presenter will cover the purpose of analysis, typical types of speed calculations for motor vehicle and pedestrian impacts, important terms and concepts, video examples of pedestrian collisions, video examples of motorcycle collisions, video examples of tractor trailer collisions, types of commercial vehicle inspections, calculations of total stopping distance, lamp examinations, and finally, EDR downloads for vehicles. The presenter for today's program is Frank Costanzo. Frank is a traffic accident reconstruction specialist with over 1,500 full-scale collision investigation and component defect evaluations. Frank is a certified court expert with over 24 years of experience in collision reconstruction, defect investigations, biomechanical analysis, and injury causation studies. We'll take two question and answer breaks during today's program, and we encourage all attendees to submit questions by using the chat or Q&A feature located on the right-hand side of the screen. I've indicated its location with my green pointer. Tomorrow morning, I'll send out an email with the link to the archive recording of this program, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation used, used during today's webinar. We do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. We're going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Mr. Frank Costanzo. Frank, the program's all yours. Well, uh, thanks for taking a, an hour out of your time uh, to attend the webinar. Um, I hope it's, uh, you can get some uh, useful information to save your money or make your money. That's uh, what everybody tells me. So um, let's get started. Um, well, there's, there's an interesting uh, understanding when we prepare uh, accident reconstruction reports, and actually I hear it's the same in the medical field that, uh, you know, all uh, determinations have to be done with a, you know, a reasonable degree of engineering or basically scientific certainty. And the reason why I think that's an interesting uh, uh, term is uh, a lot of experts don't really understand that term. Uh, years ago, I, I was in court, and uh, they asked another expert uh, what his understanding was of a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. And um, the other expert uh, made a statement that, uh, well, it's a percentage of uh, his understanding of how correct he was. And he said, and they asked him, followed up, and he goes, well, reasonable degree means, you know, I'm 75% uh, right, uh, correct in this case. So you can imagine what the next follow-up question would be to someone who uh, makes that statement was, well, you would agree with me that 25% of the time you're, you're wrong. Uh, the reasonable degree, the reason why that standard is, is, People in my field, police officers, we deal with other people's information. So uh, there is a reasonable degree of certainty that the data that we're given and using is correct. So there, there really is no percentage, but you have to thoroughly understand what a reasonable degree of certainty is uh, and do your conclusions match that reasonable degree of certainty. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, important terms and concepts, uh, like Matt said, if you have any questions, uh, if I don't answer your question correctly, uh, just uh, let me know by the chat feature and uh, I can certainly help you out. Um, two different types of uh, basically marks that are used for speed analysis are skid marks and yaw marks. We'll talk about that. There's a term called crush deformation. We'll we, that's used for speed calculations in delta Vs. Momentum analysis is another type of method we use uh, to calculate impact speeds of cars. Um, a skid mark, real, uh, really easy. Um, to be able to use a skid mark in a minimal speed calculation, and the reason why I say it's a minimal speed in most cases, uh, in most cases you'll see a skid mark that leads to an impact. Well, the skid mark is just representative of the speed dissipated by the skidding. Um, if you really wanted to know the total travel speed, you'd have to combine the, the impact speed and the skid speed. But here's a couple things you need to know. You need to know the length of the skid mark. You need to know the coefficient of friction. And that term is you need to know the pull of the roadway. Sometimes 
You also hear of a drag factor. It's the same thing. Uh, skid marks start light and get darker as they skid on. The uh, reason why that is is as the tire heats up, uh, it tends to bring the oil to the surface, and as it's sliding and creating friction, more and more friction, it tends to actually burn the asphalt, burn the oil onto the, an asphalt roadway. So when you look at a skid mark, like in this one, this is a motorcycle skid mark, it starts shallow, light, and then it gets darker as it proceeds forward. Uh, this is another uh, type of skid mark you see. You can see how uh, the, the um, section that's light before it really darkens up. The terms called the it's called basically the impending skid is when the tire starts to lock up. You can see a kind of a shadowing, and as it skids, it gets darker and darker. This is the term of a skid mark. A skid mark is a tire that's locked. And it's locked because we apply our brakes. It's locked and it's sliding. That is the term of a skid mark. In comparison to a yaw mark, this is a little section of a yaw mark, and I'll show you another point. A yaw mark is different from a skid mark because a yaw mark is the tire is rotating. It's not locked. It's rotating, and the vehicle is sliding sidewards. Uh, that is a yaw mark. You see it when someone applies a steering maneuver, and the car starts to slide, slide sidewards. Um, the the yaw mark, the length of the yaw mark, is not something that's very important in the speed calculation. What is really important is the curvature of the yaw mark. So when you're dealing with a deposition of an uh, of a, a police officer of another expert, and you start getting outside the realm of a skid mark, and you start talking about a yaw mark. Uh, the question that needs to be asked them is, did they take the proper measurements to get the radius of the yaw mark? Uh, not the length of the yaw mark. If a police officer told me, or I say police officer, but if someone told me that a radius, that the length of a yaw mark is 200 feet, it, it doesn't mean that that is a usable information to put in a formula to calculate the speed. We actually have to know what the radius of that, the curvature of that is. I told you that the uh, yaw mark, uh, the skid mark, gives a minimal speed. What a yaw mark does, when we use a yaw mark, it gives us a critical speed. And what the critical speed means is it actually gives us the speed in, at the point that the yaw mark is being made, which is actually the travel speed of the vehicle. So that's the difference. When a yaw mark gives you the actual travel speed of the vehicle, and a skid mark, will, in most cases, will give you a minimal speed. Now, a skid mark, in, in some scenarios, like when a, a car hits a pedestrian, the length of that skid mark is pretty much uh, the travel speed of the car because he's not losing a lot of momentum when he hits the pedestrian. Here's another yaw mark. It's a better picture. Look down at the right. You can see how the striations are different than it would be for a skid mark. Uh, when you see this type of striation, uh, it, you're talking about a yaw mark. And um, it, in, some, in most cases, well, in a large majority of the cases, the yaw marks are skid uh, or um, curved, I'm sorry. Here's the same mark. This was the case where uh, someone was coming down uh, an expressway, uh, overreacted to something going on in, her, uh, in the travel lane, the person oversteered to the right, sent the vehicle sidewards off the roadway, and this, that sideward movement of the vehicle yet left a yaw mark from the left lane into the right lane and off the roadway. Okay. So we got two different types of uh, like speed calculations we can do. We can do a speed calculation from a skid mark. We can do a speed calculation from a yaw mark. This is another way of calculating a speed, and it's called a crush deformation. And what a crush de deformation is, these are two cars that struck each other in a fatal, but what a crush deformation does is it looks at the car. When we tell the programs that we know how much damage there is to the car, there's a method of measuring the car, we have to be able to tell the program how much crush there is to the car. So what the program does is, it takes the crush, it gives other variables like the stiffness and the size, and it tells us what speed is necessary to cause that damage to that car. Now, obviously, in most cases, 
the most important factor is to have a car. Uh, you can sometimes derive crush measurements off photos. Uh, it'd have to be the right type of photo, but in to get uh, access to the car is really important to do a crush deformation. Uh, what is the definition of minimal speed? I have a question from uh, one of the uh, people attending. Now, minimal speed is uh, the minimal speed of a skid mark would be the minimal speed in which the car was traveling. What I mean by that is when the t when it skids. For instance, if you have a car that skids into a pole, and you know you see the skid marks, and you start calculating the speed from the skid mark. The reason why we say that is a minimal speed is we're not taking into consideration any of the speed lost when it hits that pole. There is a way of doing it, but that's why a skid mark is called a minimal speed because in high majority of the cases, unless it's a pedestrian case, it, it goes forward and strikes another vehicle. Here's another case, uh, another uh, case actually took crush measurements, but there's another method which you see police officers and people try to attempt. It's difficult, but they try to attempt. It's called a momentum analysis. These are two cars that were involved in, uh, in a collision. And what's interesting about this case is, um, you know, this biomechanical uh, kind of a trauma analysis I've been doing a long time. And if I told you to look at both these cars, and I told you that two people died in one of the cars, which car would you pick? And I think most people, absent of the fire damage, would probably pick the more damaged car. But in reality, it's the red car on the right side. And uh, the reason why two people died in this case, well, not the reason, but uh, we have factors that we have to consider in regards to uh, injuries, and the two people driving in this car were both in their 80s. And... The facts are that the older you get, the more successful, uh, successful you are to injuries. But this is the same case I'm going to move forward. Um, oops. When we talk about uh, crush analysis, this would be a good example of a crush analysis. This was, uh, you know, I'll play it again. Uh, this is a case where a, a car, let me see here, a car's approaching a toll booth. Well, let me see if I can rewind this. There we go. And uh, it's going to approach the toll booth and collide. It's an older vehicle. Collide into the, the pillar of the toll booth. Now, it doesn't lock up its brakes. It doesn't have any yaw marks. If that vehicle is accessible and it's not, we can't download it. Uh, we can take a set of crush measurements off the front of the car and do that process, which I was telling you, this crush deformation. And, uh, in, and it will tell us the impact speed of the car. Now, since there's no skid marks, the impact speed would be pretty much the speed of the car going into the collision. Um, Frank, we do have a question here about uh, crush deformation uh, real fast from Daniel who asks, is crush deformation effective in low impact collisions? Uh, crush deformation, uh, if you have, I would not necessarily say probably not. Um, in low-speed injury analysis, uh, when, when you see the biomechanical analysis, uh, if there's any damage to the car, uh, you're getting above thresholds, which people, uh, acceleration factors, which people would be hurt. You can do it. I mean, if a car is only damaged five inches, it doesn't really matter. You can enter that information into a computer program, and it will tell you how much speed it took to produce five inches of crush to a car. Uh, so you can use it in low-speed impacts. Um, you can use it in high speed. Uh, the one thing about crush analysis is, it, you know, you can't use it in catastrophic con conditions. Say a, a car hits a pole and it shears the, you know, the car apart. Uh, you won't be able to develop any kind of crush analysis doing it that way. Okay, we have uh, a couple more questions that have come here about uh, deformation, uh, Frank. Um, what type of photos are needed to determine crisis? crush deformation? Well, uh, if you have a frontal impact, uh, say a car into a pole, you not only need a picture of the car, you know, the full frontal, you need to have angle photographs. Um, the best way is to examine the car, but if you know, if you can go to another exemplary car, if you have a, 
a collision involving a car that hits a pole, and it's a it's a 2008 Lexus uh, ES, you know, 300. You could go to another Lexus and start generating some knowledgeable crush patterns by taking the photograph and going to an exemplary vehicle. Uh, but like I said, the best way is really examining the car. Um, and then we have, just have a question here about uh, skid marks from Daniel who asked, are there still skid marks with uh, ABS brakes? Our last knockdown case, there were none. Uh, yeah, any lock brakes um, leave marks, leave uh, – what any lock brakes are, it's, it's pulsating the brake. And what it's done – the reason why any lock brakes allow you to uh, stop quicker is – it, it pulsating. What it does is the brake locks up, then releases, then locks up, then releases, and locks up, and it does that process. So when you go to the scene, you'll see little patch marks. Instead of a continuous skid mark, you'll see a little patch mark that's just basically the contact part of the tire on the road. Then you'll see a gap. Then you'll see a, you know a mark. One thing about any lock brake marks is they don't last very long. Uh, if you have an accident on a Monday and uh, there's some anti-lock skid marks, and uh, it's raining on a Tuesday and a Wednesday, there's a, there's a possibility that they won't even be visible on Friday. They don't leave a really thick, dark mark like I was showing you uh, on the skid marks. So uh, unless you get out there quickly, um, there's, a, there's a probability that you won't see it. Now, I, I see it all the time in deposition. Someone's driving an anti-lock brake car, and uh, there's no anti-lock brake marks, and they say, well, I, I know for a fact I jammed on my brakes. Well, I can tell you this much. If you, if you jam on your brakes on an anti-lock brake car, you will leave marks. Uh, whether someone can see them and they're visible, that's up to the ability of the people doing the analysis, but there are marks. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions, Frank. Uh, thank you for taking those during your presentation. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, this is a momentum analysis, and the one thing about momentum analysis uh, that's, um, I wouldn't say dangerous, but the one thing you have to understand is when someone does a momentum analysis of two cars, it produces speeds of both cars. And the reason why I show this one is this is a good example of a momentum analysis that, you know, it depends how you really phrase the momentum analysis, and I think you'll understand when I tell you. Um, Remember that one photo I showed a couple uh, slides ago, the, the one that was uh, fire damage and the red car? That's this case right here. The fire damage car is coming up to the stop sign. He's going to proceed through the stop sign without stopping. I'll explain how we can make that observation. And down on the left side, you can see this little arrow. Can you see the arrow, Matt? Uh, uh, yes, he's a, the arrow. He's approaching uh, the arrow. Yeah. Okay, good. He's approaching the driveway on the right-hand side. That's the car that caught fire. Here's the other car. You can see the stop sign here in the far background. Uh, the car, the two elderly sisters are uh, going down this travel lane, and they're going to make a left into this driveway here, uh, same driveway that the guy was approaching. Now, let me uh, phrase this by saying the following in, uh, analysis could be made. Well, I know that the car didn't stop at the stop sign because the speed in which it could generate, it can't be done in that distance. So I know he didn't come to a complete stop at the stop sign because it's just outside the capabilities of the car. Now, that guy was drunk and driving without insurance. You know, he's kind of a mess. And uh, so if he just left it at that in a, in a report, I think a lot of us will say, well, yeah, he's responsible for this case. But the, the, the whole story would be, too, is the people, this, these people that are making this left turn into the driveway, their calculated speed was 22 miles an hour. And a question was asked to me by the person who retained me was, what are you trying to say, that they didn't stop? And I said, yeah, the, the principles hold true for this car, too. They can't, from a stop position, accelerate, say, 12 feet and get to 22 miles an hour. So, you know, uh, they lived here their whole lives, and they probably made this turn a thousand times, and they didn't stop. So the person who hired me said, well, you know, we're probably going to pay out on this claim. <laughs> so, uh, 
So because uh, they had the duty, they had the duty to yield it right away. So you can see how the story is incomplete when you just talk about one car. So I, I think what I'm trying to tell you is if you ever see a report that talks about a momentum analysis and is just talking about one car, then they're probably hiding something because it's going to provide the speed of the other car too. And trust me, if you do an analysis and the other part is helpful, you're going to put it in a report. Any questions about that? No? All right, keep going. Uh, yeah, I don't. So, excuse me? No, I don't see uh, any questions. Continue okay. on. Well, keep going. There's, um, so we did about cars. We did skid marks. We did yaw marks. We did crush deformation. We did um, momentum analysis. They're all kind of uh, car-based analysis. So let's kind of, we have uh, some time. We have a half an hour. Let's go into some other stuff. This is, when you ever hear the word vault, it's usually pertaining to either a motorcycle operator or a pedestrian. And the idea behind this is if if you know how far someone is thrown, vaulted, and at first they have to make sure that they're vaulted, and that's a discussion to be held later, but if if you know that a person is vaulted off a vehicle, if you know the distance and some of the variables that are associated with the point of impact and final rest of the pedestrian, you're able to calculate speeds, and the speed of the pedestrian exactly goes back to the speed of the car. So if you in pedestrians, when we know a vault, we know the estimated point of impact, we know the final rest of the pedestrian, it meets the criteria of being a vault, uh, we're able to calculate, use some formulas, and give speeds, vault speeds. And that's uh, pedestrian-based. Oh, I don't need that. This is an animation of a pedestrian impact. And I'll play it one more time. So it, the reason why I like to show this one is, so in this case, we need to know where the estimated impact is. Uh, you know, we could get that through an eyewitness in this case. He's crossing. We know where they're hit. So let's do the estimated point of impact. We know that. We have an idea where the person landed after the vault. In that case, we'd be able to calculate, and it meets the criteria of a vault, we'd be able to use a formula to do a speed, a vault speed calculation. Oops, what happened here? This would be associated with a motorcycle vault. Let me try to play this one. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not used to this. Hi, it's coming. The, the motorcycle is going to be coming to you from your left hand side. The car is turning. I'll play it one more time. You can see the vault of the motorcycle. It's the same type of scenario that uh, we would use for a vault. We know where the estimated impact is. Oops, can't get this to play back. Oh, here we go. Uh, so let's let's walk through it. Do we know where the estimated impact is? Yeah, we could do that. We know where they're turning. You can see how the the, the, the motorcycle operator gets vaulted off the seat. We know where his estimated landing point, final rest position is. So we're able to use this type of data, even if it's not a pedestrian, if it's a motorcycle operator, start getting vault speeds for motorcycle collisions. The, the one thing I, I want to show you, too, is uh, let's play this back one more time. Look at the, this is a real life video, too. Look at the dynamics of a person who gets vaulted from a motorcycle. As you can see, they, they don't like fly off like Superman. They actually are barrel rolling off the collision. The reason why that is, is in a large majority of motorcycles, when they're vaulted off the seat, they're coming forward and their legs start getting caught in the handlebars. It tends to make the, the, the body spin like that. Well, in that type of scenario, it takes more energy for someone to spin than it would just to fly off the bike. So. In motorcycle collisions, when you use vault calculations, uh, in general, it usually results in, in, in kind of lower speeds. Wanted to do this one last bit. This is kind of a discussion. Let's look at this. We know we talked about skid marks, talked about yaw marks. This happened in Japan. He's all right. He, he bounces back up. Don't worry about him. Uh, but in this case, would we be able to calculate a speed for the motorcycle operator? 
well, he didn't really vault. He just kind of popped up on the, you know, up and came right down. Uh, we would be able to calculate the speed of the uh, of the car. Well, yeah, it hit an immovable barrier. We could do the crush and figure out the speed of the car. But in in some cases, you just can't do anything. Uh, so it's not like every case you have is going to fall into a category where we're able to actually calculate a speed for it. He does get up. Uh, any questions? Uh, we have a couple questions here in the queue, Frank, uh, real fast. And I know you're going to talk about uh, inputting information into programs to, to get to get the uh, the data that you need. But um, we have a question here, and uh, excuse me, um, um, from Ned, who asks: You mentioned a program. Is that his program, or do you use a commercial computer program to generate the uh, the data that you've referenced? Uh, in previous slides? Uh, well, speed calculations, you can buy. There's all kinds of commercial uh, programs you can buy. You could do it yourself. I, I use a program called AR Pro, but there's all kinds of for, you know, programs out there that if you know information, if, a, if an attorney wants to save money and do the calculations himself, he certainly could purchase these programs. You just got to make sure you're using the right calculation. As far as crush programs, <clears throat> programs get a, as the as the technique gets a more more advanced, the programs get more expensive. So there's there's programs called uh, you know like Crash Three, Ed Crash, Slam. They all kind of do uh, computer calculations. What's nice about the programs are it, it lets you do multiple calculations uh, quickly. Uh, that's the the necessary means, but if that's a question, uh, if not, you know, help me out. But that they, uh, can you buy these programs? Sure, you can buy these programs. Uh, just do a search on the internet, and you, you can find all kinds of programs out there. Okay, great. We have a question here about uh, vaulting from Daniel, who asks: Is there a way for a pedestrian to land five or ten feet from the point of impact without being vaulted? Um, what goes into determining whether or not a pedestrian? Um, or, or someone who's riding a motorcycle um, has been vaulted. Ah, uh, that's a, that's an interesting question. Uh, can someone land five feet from a point of impact? Yes, they can, and it's probably not a vault. What happens in some pedestrian cases is a person's hit and they actually slide off the side of the car. They're never they never really get thrown forward. They just kind of hit and. There's not the term is maximum engagement. At some point during the collision, does the car and the pedestrian actually get stuck together? That's the best way of explaining it. And is the p pedestrian and the motorcycle person actually thrown from the collision? Um, that's the things you really have to, you know, when a car hits a pedestrian. Sometimes a car hits a pedestrian. The, the pedestrian slides back to the windshield, hits the windshield, and kind of slides off the side. Well, that's not a vault. Uh, and then there's cases where uh, it's hit, it goes to the windshield, and it's just like that animation, and it is a vault. So that's really needs to be the determination of, I guess, the expert, because he's the one who knows better. But that would be the criteria of using the program. If you use the program, the vault programs, and he never did vault, you're going to get bad results. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions, so why don't we continue on with the presentation? All right. Uh, in Pennsylvania, I know there's other people outside the state of Pennsylvania, but uh, this holds true, uh, I think, in most states. Uh, there's a term called mix-up. Uh, maybe in different states it's called something, but in Pennsylvania, uh, mix -up is a mechanical safety assistance program, and what it is, it's uh, basically doing inspections of uh, medium or heavy-duty trucks that are involved in cases. Uh, I think in the last couple of years, it actually has been enacted where uh, a mix-up require, is required in all fatals in Pennsylvania. Now, whether they do it or not, is uh, I, I can't force them to do it, but it is in the motor vehicle code. Uh, this was an interesting case where um, a fire truck came around a curve uh, and uh, flipped and actually killed a volunteer fireman. Uh, seriously injured him or killed him as an old case. But um, when you looked at the case itself and you looked at the eye, he was responding to a barn fire. And when you looked at it just on the basis of what the people were saying, 
it, it's around a curve, and you can see the marks, and it looks like the the, uh, the fire truck was just going too fast around a curve, and that's kind of what the tone was in the police report. But um, so processes forward, and this case is kind of interesting because the fire truck was just bought a week before this collision. It was bought out of state and brought into the state of Pennsylvania. So uh, when the inspection, when um, you know, we were requested to do the inspection of the uh, fire truck, this was present. And uh, since we're kind of lost with time, this is the suspension of the, uh, this is called a leaf spring system. What a leaf spring system does is it provides the lateral, it pres provides the suspension of this fire truck. You can see the leaf spring on the left side. When my mechanic, uh, forensic mechanic, was doing the inspection, he noticed this fracture of the leaf spring, and it was rusted. And the interesting part of this rust part was the mechanical inspection was done within days of the collision. And, um, you know, I, I, with a reasonable degree of certainty, I'm not a metallurgist, but uh, this just the way this looked could not rust within a day. So what happened was this vehicle came in state, went through its state inspection, it was okay, it was certified for street use, with this fractured leaf spring. And with a fractured leaf spring, it would not pass inspection. In fact, a leaf spring system is one of the requirements uh, that they have to look at for an inspection. So, I mean, if you go back and just look at that, and look what the police said, you would have no doubt that the guy was going too fast, but when you start to see a suspension problem, it starts to play in with this loss of control. And, all right, uh, kind of a, we'll give you a mishmash of uh, different stuff, but uh, this is the thing I talk to, you know, we try to talk to people about it all the time, and what is a perception reaction phase? When I talk to an attorney and we're talking about stopping capability of a car. What a perception reaction phase is, if you just want to know two things, to be able to stop a vehicle is in two phases. The person has to perceive and react to a situation, and then they have to brake the vehicle to a stop in general, if you're going to brake. So what happens, and let's use a deer for a scenario. If a deer jumps out in your way, this is the process that the car would go through with the driver. He has to see the deer. He has to recognize the deer as some kind of dangerous situation. And then he'd lock up his brakes to avoid the deer. Well, a perception reaction phase in the daytime is about 1.6 seconds. And at nighttime, it's 2.5. You can, the uh, brake lag we'll talk about later. But during that time, during the 1.6 seconds and 2.5 seconds, your car is also moving. So you have to be able, if you can't complete a perception reaction phase, you can't avoid an object. So uh, if the event takes shorter than that, if the event, say, um, a pedestrian jumps in front of a car and he moves only a couple feet and the movement time of that is a half second, well, the driver is in a no escape situation. He's not going to be able to complete a perception reaction phase, so he's not going to be able to avoid that accident. In fact, that accident scenario where a pedestrian walks in front of a car and the car's two feet away, that collision is going to happen 100% of the time. Um, same in nighttime. You can see how the, it increases. The reason why it increases the deer scenario. We see the deer. We recognize the deer. We know where the deer is. At nighttime, you know, it kind of looks gray. We're not really sure it's a deer until we have an extended perception reaction time. <clears throat> now, this goes on to show you how we do total stopping distances, and I'll do a couple for you with tractor trailers. So we have the perception reaction distance, and we have the total braking distance. Now, um, as the speed goes up, the, the distance required to stop the car goes up. I mean, it's that simple. So... Let's do a little uh, kind of analysis for you. This is an old case, but it's an interesting case, and I, I want to do a little um, kind of a test with you, if you don't mind, uh, and see how um, you would react to this. Here's the scenario. A tractor-trailer driver is driving at night, completely dark out, and um, let me see what this 
speed is here. I want to cheat a little bit and move. Okay. He's going 55 miles an hour in a completely dark, unlit roadway. In this case, this track, this car was slowing, and the tractor trailer ran over him and uh, caused some serious injuries. But what I want you to do is, when we talked about total stopping distances, keep in mind, I want you to do this process. Get a number in your head at 55 miles an hour on a dark, unlit roadway, how much distance does it take a tractor trailer to come to a complete stop? Think about a number and we'll move forward and see what we get. So at 55 miles an hour, that truck is traveling 80.63 feet per second. So I, I have three seconds here. That's the 2.5 seconds perception reaction time and a half a second for brake lag. So with a perception reaction distance at 55 miles an hour, he travels 241 feet. Now, when we try to give uh, um, the jury uh, references, that's a, it's important. Uh, I, I find a football field always uh, is a good reference for people. So football field's 300 feet. So we're talking a perception reaction phase that takes 241 feet. Not quite a football field, but at least three quarters of a football field, and and then we have a situation where the braking is a situation. Someone asked me about anti lock brake marks. This is anti lock brake marks are similar to this. This is called a jump skid. But when I was talking about patch marks, anti lock brake marks would leave marks even smaller than that. But they would look something. This is a jump skid. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this type of jump skid and. Um, it's kind of weird doing a webinar. You can't ask people questions. You can't see them. But usually I ask someone, you know, what's a jump skid? You see this. What's it produced by? And uh, it's produced by an empty trailer, an empty trailer where the tractor is undergoing heavy braking and the trailer is actually bouncing down the roadway, braking. As it bounces up and down, it leaves these little jump skids. But at 55 miles an hour, it takes them 268 feet to break to a stop. So when I ask you to do that calculation, it's like 500 feet. It takes a tractor trailer at night, completely dark roadway, traveling 55 miles an hour to come to a stop. And, uh, you know, that's, that's it's a long distance. And one of the, I always tell people that, um, you know, where's the most dangerous part of a tractor trailer? You hear people, oh, on the sides are blind spots and, you know, don't be behind them. Well, in my experience, the most dangerous part is in front of them. Because if there's an event that happens, like in our area off of like 81 or the Schuylkill or any of these big roadways and, and vehicles slow, then you're in a situation where the tractor trailer that's traveling needs 500 feet to come to a stop. I mean, and that's why these tra you know, tractor-trailer driver has to really monitor their speed and anticipate this type of situation because that's a quite a long distance. I don't know if anybody thought it was 500, but um, that that's what it is. Um, and there's that term, no escape, too. Um, I drove around for years looking for this type of... <laughs> I found one in Delaware. Uh, this is... a. Uh, ever see anything like this? a trailer that does not have a tractor, a tractor that does not have a trailer attached. It's actually a term called bobtailing. And uh, most tractor-trailer drivers don't like the bobtail because it reduces their braking ability. And you can imagine you're eliminating all the brakes of the trailer to be able to stop this tractor. The reason why I look for this is uh, these, these are uh, traditional, conventional. They're not made really, you won't see them on the roadway much. But the reason that this is interesting is if this was on the roadway and this tractor weighing about 25,000 pounds goes under heavy braking, the braking capability of this unit is about 10%. And the reason why it's 10% is once these tires are locked, what the momentum does is it actually pulls these two rear tires up off the roadway. You can see how this pitches down. These two tires pull up. So the only thing st stopping this 25,000 pound vehicle is the front two tires. So I would recommend for the safety of everybody to give these bobtailing tractors plenty of distance. Uh, you know, we just did the calculation of 500 feet. 
I mean, and then that's with 80% braking. So it, it takes quite a long distance for something like this to be able to come to a stop in a heavy brake situation. Uh, Frank, just real quickly, uh, do you have time to go back and go over that braking distance calculation? Uh, again, we've had some questions come in who were wondering sure. if you could kind of break that down step by step for them. Okay, sure. Uh, <clears throat> Well, I guess I'll have to explain what brake lag is, uh, since I kind of skirted by brake lag. Let's move back. Brake lag is 0.5 seconds. What brake lag is, tractor trailers, the newer tractor trailers don't really have brake lag now. But in older tractor trailers, since it's an air system, it's not a mechanical system like a car. It's an air system like, uh, like a tractor trailer. And uh, what happens is there's a, a lag between the time that you push your brake down to the time that the pressure is actually thrown through the chamber to break the vehicle. It's called a brake lag. Now, newer tractor trailers, have, the design have kind of eliminated brake lag, but that's why it'd be, uh, in older tractor trailers it would be an additional 0.5 seconds. So let's move and go through that cal calculation again. So the question is, we want to stop this tractor trailer. He's going 55 miles an hour. This is the perception reaction phase, the first step that this tractor trailer is going to go through. So he's traveling 55 miles an hour. When we convert that to feet per second, which is necessary, he's going 80.63 feet per second times three seconds. What three seconds is is the nighttime perception reaction, which is 2.5 seconds, and adding in the 0.5 for brake lag. So a total nighttime perception reaction phase for a tractor trailer would be approximately, or an older tractor trailer would be about three seconds. So at three seconds, you do the math here, he travels 241 feet at 55 miles an hour. If I did this math wrong, I, I, I'll, I'll apologize. I'm pretty sure it's correct. Look above uh, this picture. You see this uh, braking calculation here, braking distance? S equals 30 Fn. Uh, F is the drag coefficient, Dra dry roadway is about a 0.75, and N is the braking efficiency of a tractor trailer. In older tractor trailers, they usually generate about 80% braking efficiency, different from 100. Cars have 100. And the, the reason why is just the dynamics of uh, the tires. The tires cause, they're harder, and the dynamics of the basically how they brake, so, and this is all done by testing, but in general, tractor trailers generate about 80%. So if you walk through this calculation, you put 55 squared, 30 FN, you do that calculation, it gives you a braking efficiency, it gives you a braking distance of 268 feet. So when we add 268, 268 plus the 210, I think the other one was, 268, 268 plus 241, and I have down here, it's about 500 feet. It's close to 500 feet. That's how we would calculate what the total stopping distance would be of that tractor trailer I showed you, showed you on top of the car. Any questions? Okay, and the data that you are using for this example, that was pulled out of just uh, an example case that you've had? Yeah, that's an example case, but it, it can be applied to almost any case. I have a, there's a question here, what is the source of your data? Um, I don't exactly know what he means by that, but what's a typical drag coefficient on a dry asphalt surface? Typical uh, on a dry asphalt surface, it usually runs between 0.70 to 0.80. I mean, the most accurate way is to take a drag sled and actually test the roadway, but you'll see sources that give you about 0.70 to 0.80 on a dry asphalt roadway. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thanks, Frank. I don't see any more questions, so why don't we continue on with the, the presentation? Okay. Um, this is an interesting thing about the point of impact with uh, pedestrian collisions. And the thing that's interesting is um, I think people overreact to shoes. I mean, to be honest with you, they'll see a shoe placement and they'll initially think that um, that's where the impact happened. Uh, the reason why shoe placements are uh, kind of dangerous, in this case, it would be really highly unlikely that a shoe uh, 
thrown off a person would land two shoes would land like this like he's actually walking but i like this for this scenario um we have how many people attending this thing 66 people uh, if everybody looks down and looks at their soles or their, the type of shoes they're wearing usually when i do this in a class setting i bet you there's only like one or two people wearing hard soled shoes like hard soled dress shoes uh what happens in collisions is when someone who's wearing a hard-soled shoe gets hit, they usually leave like little scuff marks on roadways. So if we see the shoe, the shoe better correspond with a mark on the roadway. These are sneakers. And this was the case uh, that they used the one on the double yellow line and said, well, well, that's where the pedestrian was hit. He was hit on the double yellow line. And my argument was, well, why not the other one on the shoulder? Why the one on the double yellow line? And, you know, no one had an answer because they work backwards and it kind of fit the analysis. So when we look at these shoes, when we pick up a shoe, hopefully there's a corresponding mark on the roadway. I think my point is when we, we're dealing with pedestrian impacts, the, the determining the exact point at which a pedestrian was struck is really hard. So we use words like estimated impact area. Like we don't know exactly what point, but we know kind of the area was hit. <clears throat> uh, there's another uh, import, important term. Uh, it's called point of contact or maximum engagement. Uh, it's. I wish this photo was a little better, but here's an area. You see how you start to get scuffing? When, when, when two cars hit, they tend to dip down on the roadway, and they start to leave little chips and gouge marks. So when two cars collide in an accident, uh, the first responders, the police or me or whoever go out there to determine an impact area, that's the first thing they're going to start looking for are chips and gouge marks. And then, But the presence of a chip and a gouge mark doesn't necessarily mean that that's where the impact happened. The next step is similar to what the shoe is, is you got to go underneath the car to make sure there's some component of one of the cars that made this chip or gouge mark. Because if you don't do that, the question is going to be, well, how do you know it wasn't there before the collision? So when you have a chip or gouge mark, the important thing is to be able to have access, hopefully, to the cars to show that there's some part of the suspension that, meet, that would make a chip or gouge mark to determine it's called maximum engagement or, you know, impact area. Um, this is an interesting case, and, and this is reason why when I do pedestrian cases, I always ask for the uh, the injuries, and people are like, well, I'm seriously hurt. I said, well, I want the discharge summary. And uh, how much time we have? Five minutes, perfect. Um, this is the way this, init this case initially went. Drivers coming down this direction, she gives a statement that there was three little girls on this area, and one of them ran out in front of her. So we talked before. I mean, if that scenario is true, and she's like, I was like 10 feet away, and here's the telephone pole was at night, and that would be a no-escape situation. But what's interesting is when you move forward and you look at the injury pattern of the pedestrian, the one thing you're looking for is a right femur, is some kind of lower uh, torso trauma. So when you look in this case and you see there's a right femur fracture, let's back up. I got a question for you. If the little girl's coming out this way, how does she get a right femur fracture? How does she have no injuries to the left side of her body where she would be struck, but have a right femur fracture? So this was just basically a case evaluation that someone wanted to you know, um, see if he has a case. So well, the way it proceeded after depositions, these, uh, the girls were actually coming in this direction. The one girl was coming across the roadway, tra traveling this way. And you can see how it changes the whole dynamics of the case. So when you hire someone to do a pedestrian accident investigation, provide them with as, the injury so he can make sure he has the travel directions of the pedestrians correct. Breaking percentages of motorcycles. Um, Breaking percentage or any, we talked about tractor trailers. In general, I don't know if uh, all you guys uh, who rode motorcycles or not, but in general, uh, rear brakes are used a lot in, in emergency situations. 
Uh, if you apply just the rear brake of a motorcycle, you're only generating 35 to 40 percent braking capability. Now, the only way to really get a full lockup is to apply the rear and the front brake. But when you do that type of scenario, you won't be able to skid very long. You're going to go down. So, uh, you know, from you talk to motorcycle experts who do riding, they say, well, I would take my chance and apply both. But if you have a skid mark that goes for quite a distance, say 100 feet of a motorcycle skid mark, I can tell you that's his rear brake. It, there would be no possibility that a person would be able to skid on the rear and the front brake leading to the point of impact. Talked about braking efficiency. Lamp, shot, uh, lamp analysis. This is an interesting, uh, I'll kind of speed it up here so everybody can uh, ask questions, but hot shock. What hot shock is is when a, lamp, when a light is on and illuminated, this filament that goes across from stem to stem is hot and kind of glowing. So when a force is applied to the light, it actually deforms the light. This thing's supposed to go straight across. Actually, you see it's deformed. It's hot shock. It shows you that this turn signal is activated at the time of impact. It has to be close to the impact area, but that's what it, this tells you. This is cold shock. This is a headlight. You can see how it's not deformed. So in a scenario where someone says uh, the car was driving at night without its lights on and you inspect the headlights and it shows cold shock, that would support the information that that light was not illuminated upon impact. Uh, airbag deployments, uh, I'm going to have to speed this up a little bit, but um, airbag downloads you can do. Uh, the selection in which we can do airbags has increased dramatically over the, the last couple of years. You can download uh, cars now. Uh, if you want to know what cars to download, I can send the link to you. Um, but uh, it gives speeds of deployment. It gives speeds of non-deployment. It gives you seatbelt usage. The newer the car, the more information you're going to get. Uh, the reason why um, airbag analysis are interesting, besides from the, the obvious, it gives you the speeds of cars, uh, it also gives you acceleration patterns, and when you look at something like this, you can see the person's going the same speed over a period of, say, five seconds. It would be an interesting case because if someone came to a stop sign and they're initially say, I came to a stop and I pulled out and I got hit, and you download their airbag and it shows for five seconds that they're going the same speed, that would show that they never stopped at the stop sign. This, that's a Chevy download. <clears throat> this is the the information that's usually uh, asked for by experts, uh, deposition reviews, the interrogatories. Uh, sometimes they ask to review the complaint. Uh, if you have case file photographs, I would uh, I would uh, recommend you send colors if you can. Uh, always, you know, when possible, do a scene inspection. Uh, sometimes you can't do a scene inspection if they have like on I-95 where they have a no stop policy and. Everybody's at risk if they get out of their car. Of course, they're not going to do a scene inspection. Vehicle inspections, we always request those. Um, these are things, uh, the preconceived conclusions kind of working backwards. That's the most uh, interesting one here. And the reason why I can say that is uh, people fall into this trap. Police officers and first responders do. They start talking to people at the collision scene and they start to get kind of uh, information regarding the speed of cars. And what they do is instead of working forward, taking all the physical evidence and kind of calculating speeds and working forward, in their mind they have this preconceived conclusion that the person was speeding because the eyewitnesses said that. So they actually kind of work backwards and make sure that all the information kind of fits into the idea he was speeding. And that, that's a problem the, I tried to teach people not to do, but inevitably I, I see it quite often that people work backwards in conclusions. Um, we have a couple minutes here. Um, is there any other questions I can answer? Uh, we do have a couple questions here, Frank. Uh, if you, you, you ready to, to go with questions? Yeah, let's do questions. It looks like we've got a couple minutes here. Okay. Um, MJ asks, in addition uh, to other or, or other than EDR download, 
what evidence should one look for to determine whether there was uh, true not diver caused sudden unintended acceleration? <laughs> well, if someone says it's an unintended acceleration, do yourself one favor. There's two different types of acceleration uh, systems out there. One is an electronic and one is manual. What a manual system does is it's basically a cable from the accelerator pedal to the throttle. So the way, the only way to open up an accelerator, you know, the accelerator cable is actually to press, to manually press in the accelerator. It's, it's not seen very often. In fact, uh, I don't know of any cases we have in-house that there is actually a mechanical system where you can put, push down an accelerator and it actually causes an unattended acceleration. The ones that you read about are basically electronic uh, throttles. Now, I think Toyota had a problem with them. Uh, there's been some special crash investigations. And in that sense, what happens, Toyota, I think, I, I didn't really research it that much, but what they're saying is there's an erroneous signal that goes to the accelerator uh, system that um, the person is actually not pushing down on the accelerator, but it receives an electronic signal. To be able to show that that actually happened, <laughs> you would have to really have the assistance of a car company to do a download analysis because that is really outside the scope of any kind of test I know. It's, it's outside the scope of an airbag download. It's outside the scope of a diagnostic type of um, uh, if you took it to a body shop and they did a complete diagnostic, it would be really hard to look at what to Toyota did, how to hire computer engineers to actually find out where that signal was coming from. So it, it, I think what I'm trying to tell you is if it's a mechanical system, it probably is not an unintended acceleration pattern. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question here from Daniel who asks, how much can an accident investigator contribute to proof of causation of injuries, especially soft tissue? And what information should attorneys get to allow reconstructionists to do their job? <laughs> uh, I think what he's referring to is uh, these low-speed injury analysis cases, and that's uh, maybe we'll put together another webinar because that uh, uh, takes more than a couple minutes. But uh, if you want to do this, uh, you Go to the um, go to the internet and type in uh, um, some do a search uh, precluded uh, biomechanical analysis or bio precluded biomechanical experts and you'll find out that there's quite a few that get precluded for this reason. You can give a jury pool or an arbitrator the picture of what happens as far as the acceleration degree. And you can calculate that, and you can say, well, you know what, this is equivalent to, you hear these things like uh, sitting on a chair hard or being slapped on the back hard or stepping down a step. These are all common acceleration uh, things that go perturbation of daily living, it's called. But if the expert takes the next step and then says, well, therefore, the person shouldn't have been hurt, there, it, it opens up so many different subjects that they're precluded a lot. I mean, there could be a case where they would make a decent case, but if you do your research, you'll find out that step I just explained to you, when someone takes an acceleration factor and then says someone couldn't have been hurt or could have been hurt, that's really kind of the niche of kind of the outer boundaries and when they're, they get into trouble. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue. So, Frank, would you like to make any concluding remarks? No, I just thank you for taking the hour. Uh, I hope it helped you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, email me or call me. I, I, I field a lot of calls daily, and I'll be glad to help you. And you can also contact me through TASA. They have my information, too. Hey, great. Um, Frank, thank you so much for the time and the effort that you put into this presentation. And as you said, um, if you'd like to speak to Frank uh, about a case or a project that you're currently working on, you can contact us here at TASA. Our number is 800-523-2319. As I mentioned during the introduction, tomorrow morning I will send out a copy of the or a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that was used during today's program, as well as a link to the archive recording of this program. Uh, 
The archive recording will be posted in our Knowledge Center, which can be found on the TASA website. It's TASANET.com, and if you click on the, the Knowledge Center tab, it will take you to uh, the library of our previous programs. Our next program for legal professionals, Standards in the Recreational Field, will take place on November 15th. Um, you should have received an invitation for that program actually today, um, and we look forward to seeing you at that program. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, uh, we take all comments under consideration. They help us to put on better programs. Feel free to email me at mhide at tassanet.com. Uh, with that, I'm going to end today's program, and I hope to see you at future TASA events. Thanks so much.